The fixed wing gunship, call name Spooky. During the Vietnam War, these benign cargo planes evolved into one of the most bizarre, yet most destructive weapon systems of all time. To meet the needs of unconventional warfare, crude AC-47 Dragon ships were transformed from a defender into a ruthless predator, capable of annihilating enemy targets along the famed Ho Chi Minh Trail with a devastating display of firepower. With the escalation of the war, soon emerged Gunship 2, the enormous AC-130 Spectre. Equipped with state-of-the-art sensors and the most powerful weaponry ever assembled on an aircraft, these massive gunships stalked the enemy and stripped away their ability to covertly operate at night, forever altering the nature of aerial attack. Throughout the early 1960s, South Vietnam was fighting a losing battle against communist insurgents and local guerrilla forces known as the Viet Cong. To combat local collaboration with guerrillas, the South Vietnamese government relocated citizens in many rural areas to thousands of fortified strategic hamlets. The government also created hundreds of special forces camps, particularly near the country's borders with North Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, in an attempt to stem the rising tide of communist insurgency. Here, U.S. military advisors often trained and supported Vietnamese troops in counter-guerrilla operations. Responding to the government's strategy, the Viet Cong launched devastating attacks on strategic hamlets and special forces camps throughout the country. To strengthen Vietnam's ability to combat such attacks, the U.S. deployed a detachment of air commandos to Vietnam in early 1963 under the code name Farmgate. The air commandos were sent to train the Vietnamese in close air support and interdiction tactics. However, as Viet Cong attacks intensified, farm gate crews were rapidly swept into an active combat role. Responding to desperate calls from besieged strategic hamlets and outposts, the air commandos regularly drove off assaulting forces with lightly armed North American T-28 Trojans and more heavily armed Douglas B-26 invaders. The situation improved, but only temporarily, as neither the Vietnamese nor Farmgate possessed an effective night strike capability. Realizing this, the VC began to strike government installations almost solely at night. Dismal government losses quickly resumed. To counter night attacks, the air commandos began experimenting with flare support missions. Taking off at dusk, Douglas C-47 Goonybirds and Fairchild C-123 providers roamed the skies over Vietnam, responding to calls for help. Banking into an orbit above an embattled outpost, the crew dispensed a series of parachute flares, exposing assaulting forces to defending troops. In most cases, the VC would break off their attack. However, 
the guerrillas quickly adapted to these tactics, merely waiting for the flare ship to depart before resuming their assault and often overrunning the vulnerable compound. Building on the flare concept, the air commandos initiated flare and strike missions. After a series of flares had been dropped, strike aircraft would lay down a hail of fire, a barrage of rockets, and even canisters of napalm on assaulting forces. Hundreds of outposts and thousands of lives were saved by these experimental tactics. But with limited numbers of strike aircraft and flare ships, thousands of potential targets, and the fast pace of VC hit and run tactics, a better solution had to be devised. A number of concepts were considered, but a strikingly simple concept led designers back to the versatile, rugged World War II vintage Goonie Bird. If transport crews could illuminate assaulting forces while directing follow-on airstrikes, why not arm transport so that the crew could strike on their own? Project Tail Chaser was born for the development and testing of Gunship One, the dreaded AC-47. As the gunship made its way from concept to reality, the situation in Vietnam continued to deteriorate. In response to U.S. retaliation for the Tonkin Gulf incident, the Viet Cong launched a series of attacks on Allied installations. Bien Hoa Air Base, a large Allied installation just north of Saigon, was among the worst hit. A mortar attack killed four Americans, injured 72, and damaged or destroyed 27 aircraft. It became painfully clear that the guerrilla attacks could reach anyone, anywhere, and that there were few defensive measures to deter them. Responding to a frantic search for weapons to combat VC assaults, Project Tail Chaser shifted into high gear. Guided by the determination and ingenuity of a few key men, such as Captain Ron Terry, considered by many to be the father of the gunship, two armed Goonie Birds were deployed to Vietnam in December of 64. The planes were equipped with three 7.62 millimeter Gatling guns, also known as mini guns. Each gun could fire more than 100 rounds per second. Firing together, they could put a bullet into every square foot of a football field sized target in three seconds. The guns were mounted in a door and two windows on the left side of the aircraft. A third window contained a manually operated flare launcher. Eight men manned the AC-47, with two gunners, a flare kicker, and a Vietnamese observer added to the transport's original crew. To fire on a target, the pilot had to bank the gunship into a circular orbit, or pylon turn, to the left. Once the correct amount of bank was established, the miniguns would stay aimed on a relatively fixed point of ground. From here, an intense and continuous barrage of fire could be laid down on enemy positions. The pilot actually controlled the firing of the guns. He acquired the target through the gun sight mounted by his left shoulder. The gun sight was a World War II fighter gun sight. It had a lighted ring, and in the middle of that ring was a dot of light that we call the pipper. If you put that dot of light on your target, the gun line was bore sighted to that sight line, and the guns would hit what you had the dot of light on. The co-pilot maintained the attitude of the aircraft in that he was watching the instruments, would not let you get out of control, maintained your altitude, and he maintained the airspeed with the throttles. It was critical that the airplane stay in a perfect orbit in order to be able to hit. In order to place the fire where we wanted it, we had to maneuver the airplane. We could rock the wings. That would move the fire in and out. And if you hit the rudders, you could move the fire forward and back. So we used a combination of rudders and aileron to control where we place the fire and to move it around. 
early combat evaluation revealed that the new gunship was not only spectacular at stopping enemy assaults, but also that it instilled a psychological fear out of proportion to its effectiveness. From the very first mission, no Allied installation was ever overrun while a gunship was overhead. Intelligence reports indicated devastating Viet Cong losses during raids broken up by AC-47 crews. The VC were baffled, initially guessing that strikes were coming from intense ground-based attacks, or perhaps from a new type of gun. The aircraft became legendary, coming to be known as Puff the Magic Dragon, or simply as the dreaded Dragon Ship. The name stemmed from the awesome tongues of flame and the whining roar that spewed from the guns as they fired. The gunships boosted the morale of Allied forces tremendously while completely terrorizing the enemy. As a result, plans were quickly initiated for a 16-plane AC-47 squadron to provide cover for Allied facilities throughout Vietnam. As the gunship squadron began to take shape, U.S. involvement in Vietnam escalated rapidly. President Lyndon Johnson deployed the first large combat units to Vietnam in the spring of 65. The first Marines landed at Da Nang in March. By the end of May, 50,000 U.S. troops were stationed throughout the country. In July, Johnson authorized the deployment of up to 125,000 men. As the number of ground forces increased, so too did the need for close air support. In November, a newly created 4th Air Commando Squadron was deployed to Tan Son Nut Air Base as a part of the hurried U.S. attempt to shore up South Vietnam's crumbling government. Equipped with 20 fully modified AC-47s, the squadron's primary mission was to defend installations under night attack and to supplement strike aircraft in the defense of friendly forces in the field. The Dragon ships were officially assigned the call sign Spooky, a fitting reference to their ominous night missions and camouflage. By the spring of 66, 26 crews were combat qualified and Spookies were strategically stationed throughout the country. The first mission of the evening would take off at sundown and orbit a, a point in contact with a command center. We had five locations for the uh, AC-47 all over South Vietnam and uh, we kept an airplane airborne alert all night long and plus a ground alert airplane all night. And the job was to protect special forces camps uh, that came under attack by the VC. When the word came in that a uh, camp was under attack, then we would get directed to that camp. We had the, the camps all pinpointed on a map and our navigator would tell us how to get there. In all cases, before the pilot would fire at a target, he was in contact with a, with a special forces guy on the ground inside the camp or near the camp perimeter. The guy on the ground would tell the pilots where they wanted him to hit, where the, the concentration of the Viet Cong were. And uh, that's how the uh, feedback came to all the crew. They knew exactly uh, when the attack stopped because uh, the guy on the ground would keep telling them, you got him running, keep firing. The versatility of the gunship led to various special assignments, including support for search and rescue, medevac, forward air control, and convoy escort. A few Spookies even performed armed reconnaissance missions against troops and supplies traveling down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a mission that foreshadowed the evolution of future gunship operations. However, throughout 66 and 67, the most critical mission remained defense of Allied installations. On the last day of 1966, 
the small 4th Air Commando Squadron successfully defended its 500th fort. By the end of 67, the number of outposts defended soared to 1,600. And still, no camp had ever been overrun while Spooky was overhead. While the defense of outposts, hamlets, and allied bases became critical in preventing the collapse of South Vietnam, another mission evolved that was equally challenging and urgent, close air support for troops in contact. Soon after the first Marines arrived in the spring of 65, President Johnson authorized U.S. troops to be used not only in base defense and training, but to join with the Vietnamese in taking the fight to the enemy. Initially, U.S. forces conducted holding actions designed to retain those areas already under Saigon's control. From these areas, a series of spoiling attacks were launched. The objective was to search and destroy known Viet Cong strongholds rather than to seize and hold new territory. The operations dramatically reshaped the intensity of the war. U.S. and Vietnamese troops began to regularly engage Viet Cong elements in vicious firefights. As a result, spooky crews were increasingly called upon to come to the aid of troops in contact, many of whom had become desperate after being pinned down by enemy fire. When we were supporting troops in contact, the young army soldiers were very nervous. If they were new to the experience, and the fire was getting very heavy from the Viet Cong. They sometimes would call for us to fire on their position because they felt they were in imminent danger of being overrun. When I first came into country, I had an older pilot tell me that this was going to happen. And when it did, ask them how many casualties they'd taken. And if they hadn't taken any casualties, we didn't do that. He said, you tell them that when they start taking casualties, you'll put the fire any place they want it. Identifying friendly positions was the most difficult and critical aspect of close air support. Firing around the perimeter of a fort or hamlet, even at night, was relatively simple. Installations were normally set in large clearings and had distinctive shapes. Anything outside of the perimeter was generally considered hostile. Crews supporting troops in the field faced far worse conditions. Friendly forces were often concealed by dense jungle foliage and rugged terrain. Others were engaged in violent street battles. Weather and darkness further complicated missions. And to make matters worse, crews had to avoid using flares for fear of exposing friendly positions to enemy troops. Well, when we arrived, over some troops that were just out in the jungle. Uh, they give us as much about the, the geographic facts on the area as they could. If they were close to a river or a mountain or something like that to help us orient ourselves to their position. Quite often they used a strobe light. And if they used a strobe light, then we could see the strobe and they could tell us how they were arranged around that uh, strobe light so we could fire. Unfortunately, by that time, the North Vietnamese had learned that and had captured strobe lights. And they sometimes used the strobe lights to confuse us. That was a, a problem that we had to be very concerned about because it could lead you to putting fire on friendly troops. While support for troops in contact became a vital mission, Spooky's primary role remained the defense of static bases, forts, and villages that were being hit by increasingly deadly VC assaults. In the fall of 67, the U.S. activated a second gunship squadron and increased the Dragon Ship fleet from 22 to 33 aircraft. Ultimately, commanders would have liked to have had a gunship on airborne alert over every base in South Vietnam through the critical night hours. By the start of 1968, there was an air of optimism in South Vietnam, 
U.S. and Vietnamese officials felt that vastly reinforced air, ground, and naval forces had turned the tide against the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. On January 30th, these hopes were shattered when communist forces launched their Tet Offensive. Heavy fighting reached Saigon. The old Vietnamese capital of Hue was overrun and virtually destroyed. 36 of 45 provincial capitals and 50 hamlets were attacked. The offensive ultimately ended in a large-scale military defeat for the Viet Cong. But it was clear that the war was far from over. Spooky crews were stretched to the limit as they struggled to support Allied forces throughout the country. By July, the number of outposts successfully defended, which came to be known as the Spooky Count, rose to more than 2,300. However, this would be the peak year for U.S. spooky operations. Shortly after his inauguration in January, President Richard Nixon initiated a plan for the Vietnamization of the war. Under the plan, U.S. forces would gradually withdraw, while South Vietnamese forces would be strengthened. By 1969, both spooky squadrons were deactivated and all of the AC-47s were turned over to the Vietnamese and Royal Laotian Air Forces. Despite the shift in policy, U.S. gunship operations in Southeast Asia continued to thrive and evolve. In fact, an entirely new class of gunship had already emerged and was striking at the very lifeline of North Vietnam's war on the South, the infamous Ho Chi Minh Trail. As early as 1964, the Ho Chi Minh Trail had become a critical supply line for communist forces operating in South Vietnam. The trail was actually a vast network of old footpaths that ran some 1,700 miles from North Vietnam through Laos and Cambodia to the south. As the war escalated, North Vietnam developed the trail into a complex road network that could handle convoys of large trucks. The network became much more advanced than initially expected. By 1967, there were hundreds of supply depots, large truck parks for maintenance and repair, medical facilities, and even rest and relaxation areas to boost troop morale during the long, arduous journey southward. During the spring of 65, the U.S. began launching airstrikes against a section of the trail in southern Laos. The strikes generally coincided with the dry season, roughly from mid-October to mid-April. Throughout the rest of the year, the roads in Laos became nearly impassable and flying conditions extremely hazardous due to heavy rains. Most strikes were carried out by Air Force and Navy jets, which cut roadways and struck enemy positions with bombs, rockets, and strafing runs. By mid-year, more than 1,000 sorties per month were being flown against the trail. Each year, the interdiction campaign expanded. However, a number of factors limited their overall effectiveness. North Vietnamese supply convoys began operating on the trail almost solely at night, making it difficult to locate and strike enemy targets. In addition, the high speed and heavy fuel consumption of jets afforded pilots little time to discover targets in the rough jungle terrain. And ironically, Heavy bombing along key routes pulverized the landscape, actually making road development and repair easier for the enemy in many areas. What the interdiction campaign needed was an aircraft that could loiter over infiltration routes for hours 
that could acquire targets under dense jungle foliage, even at night, and that could accurately deliver tremendous firepower on relatively small moving targets. Such an aircraft would be found in Gunship 2, the AC-130 Spectre. From the inception of Project Tail Chaser, the U.S. had been searching for a more effective follow-on aircraft to the AC-47. By 1967, the Air Force had narrowed down the replacement to either the 1950s vintage Fairchild C-119 flying boxcar or the new Lockheed C-130 Hercules. Both aircraft were ultimately selected, but it was the massive C-130 with vastly superior payload capacity and performance that was modified to become Gunship 2. From the beginning, Major Ron Terry and others who were involved in the development of Spooky intended to greatly increase the capability of this second generation gunship. However, no one anticipated that it would become the heavily armed, highly sophisticated weapon system that it did. In January of 1967, Conversion of the first C-130 was initiated under Project Gunboat. The prototype was armed with four miniguns, one more than the Spooky, and four 20-millimeter Vulcan cannons. The cannons were a potent addition to gunship firepower. Each Vulcan could fire up to 2,500 rounds of high-explosive incendiary shells per minute. A variety of equipment was also installed to improve the gunship's ability to acquire and strike targets at night. Included were a night observation device, or starlight scope, an early infrared sensor that translated heat emissions into a visible picture, a powerful 20 kilowatt searchlight that could illuminate vast target areas and a crude computerized fire control system that integrated sensor inputs to provide target position and aircraft attitude for the pilot. By June of 67, the AC-130 had entered flight trials where it was placed through extensive tests to ensure the accuracy of its potent weapon system. Fire from the new 20 millimeter cannons was devastatingly accurate, striking a floating target grid 29 times in 30 passes. While the Air Force was seeking a gunship to carry on Spooky's role as a defender, everyone involved quickly realized the Spectre's vast offensive potential. The new sensors allowed crews to locate and lock on to target trucks from a phenomenal distance, even in darkness. A few bursts from the powerful Vulcans demolished the trucks in a matter of seconds. Impressed by the dramatic test results, the Air Force quickly deployed a prototype 130 to Vietnam in the fall of 67. The Spectre did continue the tradition of Spooky initially, flying its first mission in support of a firebase under assault. Within a month, however, the crew was released from ground support for its first armed reconnaissance mission in Laos, a truck hunting mission. Shortly after arriving over a portion of the trail, a sensor operator spotted six trucks heading south. After receiving clearance to fire, the pilot banked into an attack orbit and unleashed a barrage of 20 millimeter fire on the hapless convoy. Within minutes, all six trucks were burning. I've got some more bullets and they were after where you are now. 28. The gunship's debut was both spectacular and chilling. 
still blowing stuff. The Air Force wasted little time in developing additional AC-130s. Following the communist Tet Offensive in 68, there was a renewed sense of urgency about interdiction. Commanders and airmen alike recognized that such a massive assault could never have materialized if the flow of men and supplies from the north had been choked off. Each bullet that could be stopped on the trail represented one less possible fatality in the field. In October, four specters were deployed to Ubon, Thailand with a newly created 16th Special Operations Squadron. By the end of the year, the squadron was regularly patrolling the skies over Laos, ferreting out and destroying enemy trucks as they headed down the trail. Spectre operations required a tremendous amount of technical know-how and teamwork. Eleven crew members performed very specific functions, from flying the plane to operating a sensor to loading a gun. Each man's performance determined the success or failure, and ultimately even the safety or peril of the entire crew. Sensor operators led the pilot to a target. The fire control system integrated sensor information with the relative speed and position of the gunship, allowing the pilot to place the aircraft into an attack orbit. As a pilot, I couldn't see anything. I had no navigation instruments to operate with. We go to the sector and the sensor operators would search and find the targets. Once they found a the target, the navigator would validate it with uh, the airborne command control aircraft, because we did have friendly troops on the ground in Laos from special operations, special forces, and different uh, other organizations. And the pilot would turn and look out through a uh, reflector gun sight, and there there were two symbols, a fixed symbol. They were of, light and one that moved. The fixed symbol represented where the guns were looking. The movable symbol represented where the sensors were looking. The trick was to get the movable symbol superimposed within a certain limits over the fixed symbol. And it, once you got this done, you had solved part of the problem. The rest of the problem was to maintain a 30 degree bank and also the altitude and the airspeed, because any variation would cause the bullet to miss the target. Once you got that done, you call, told the engineer who was standing behind you and calling out your bank because you couldn't see that. He would arm the guns, the gunners would arm them, and I would mash a, a button on the yoke. And if all these other parameters had been met, bullets would go out and they would hit the target. We could hit truck from two and a half miles away and do it consistently and we killed a lot of trucks we killed a lot of people which was our job and that was that's the name of the game in war destroy the other guy or destroy his equipment we did a lot good job of doing that uh, and that player is big enough to blow all the trucks off the curve in fact the block that might come out now throughout 1969 the 16th air commando squadron yielded phenomenal results on the trail In January, still equipped with only four aircraft, Spectre crews accounted for 28% of all truck kills. In April, the squadron flew less than 4% of interdiction sorties, but accounted for more than 44% of the trucks destroyed or damaged. By the end of the year, three more Spectres were deployed to expand the hunt. That is a large explosion. Man, I'm telling you. 
Despite early success, conditions over the trail were becoming increasingly hostile. In 1968, President Johnson halted U.S. bombing operations over North Vietnam, allowing communist forces time to regroup. From November of 68 through May of 70, North Vietnamese anti-aircraft defenses on the trail increased by more than 400 percent. More serious threats, such as telephone pole-sized SA-2 surface-to-air missiles, began to appear in increasing numbers. In May of 69, the inevitable finally happened, when two specters were struck by enemy anti-aircraft fire. The first landed safely, but one crewman was killed. The second burst into flames as it landed, killing two more crew members. By the summer of 1970, all remaining specters were withdrawn from combat for refurbishing. What emerged was a phenomenal weapon system that made initial specters look primitive in comparison. The surprise package AC-130. The most significant modification to the surprise package was the addition of two 40 millimeter Bofors cannons, which replaced the aft pair of 20 millimeter guns. New electronics included a low light television system, a side looking beacon tracking radar to help identify friendly positions, a laser designator and rangefinder and a new digital fire control computer. Returning to Thailand in December of 70, Surprise Package 130s immediately resumed interdiction operations over the trail. Within a month, Crews had shattered all previous interdiction records, destroying as many as 43 trucks in a single mission. The 40 millimeter cannons dramatically increased the lethal power of the 130s, while allowing for even greater standoff attack altitudes. However, it is improved sensing equipment that ultimately had the biggest impact on interdiction operations. The sensor operator was actually the eyes of the gunship. We had a forward-looking infrared sensor, a flare. Everything gives off IR energy, and it comes up on your picture as different shades of gray, depending on the amount of heat. The IR would acquire the target. He would be to have the big picture. He could see up in front of the nose of the aircraft. And then the TV would slave to the IR, acquire the target, and then he would say he had the target, and that would be the sensor of choice to fire off of because it was more stable. We also have what we call Black Crow, and he was also the electronic warfare officer. The trucks over in Southeast Asia, the ignition systems weren't shielded. So this sensor was designed to pick up the firing of the spark plugs, and it would appear on a scope, and he would actually acquire the truck driving down the trail, the engine running. And then the IR would pick it up next, and then the TV, and then we would roll in and fire on the target. The first radars were kind of washed out, fuzzy pictures. Then the later version of gave you a nice, sharp picture. I mean, you could see trucks. You could see a guy running down the road. I mean, you could see his feet, the separation of his legs. We're at altitude, and we can see all this in, on, in darkness. The battle for the trail continued to escalate. North Vietnamese determination was bolstered by the steady and unrestricted flow of trucks and supplies from the Soviet Union and China. 
From November of 1970 through June of 71, AC-130 crews damaged or destroyed more than 13,800 trucks, 4,000 in March alone. Frustrated by the success of interdiction efforts, the communists often took drastic measures to ensure the continual flow of men and supplies. A lot of times uh, when you were on the trail working it and the truck drivers were, would hear the drone of the C-130, they would stop the truck and they would abandon the truck and you could actually see them running away from their trucks and uh, we would finish the truck off. So to stop that, they started chaining them to the steering column of the truck and many of them was found, you know, uh, burned to death, dead inside their vehicles along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. As the flow of men and supplies built toward a massive North Vietnamese offensive in 1972, Spectre crews uncovered and struck increasingly impressive targets. Truck convoys carrying massive amounts of ammunition and fuel. Large truck parks containing dozens of vehicles. Ferries, sampans, and other river traffic bearing tons of supplies. Yeah, I can see that. Is that your boat? Roger, boat. Roger, Roger, and uh, you should pay to see the buildings and stuff like that just as the board makes the bend in the river there. While interdiction of enemy supply lines remained the focus of Spectre missions, the air crews never lost sight of the gunship's original role, defending friendly forces on the ground. When we were on the trail or if we were after trucks or tanks and a fire base or the, or the ground forces needed our support, we'd be immediately broke off and sent to them uh, in support. They had the priority for the airplane. Their lives were more important than a truck or a, a vehicle or something coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. By the end of 1971, North Vietnamese defense of the trail threatened Spectre crews at every turn. Heavy anti-aircraft guns and missile emplacements lined key routes. With years of combat experience, enemy gunners had developed sophisticated and deadly tactics. Concerned about the increased threat, the U.S. searched for a new weapon to provide 130 crews with even greater standoff capability. In February of 72, they found the perfect match. A heavy caliber gun that had been in use by American forces since the Second World War, the 105 millimeter howitzer. Replacing one of the 40 millimeter cannons, these powerful guns could accurately deliver a 44-pound shell more than 12,000 meters, demolishing virtually any target in a single shot. While the increased standoff range did improve crew safety, anti-aircraft fire remained a formidable threat. Defense against enemy fire largely came down to the illuminator operator. His job, in addition to dispensing flares, was to lie on the Spectre's half-opened cargo ramp, scanning the terrain for anti-aircraft fire and missile launches. When the aircraft was threatened, the I.O. immediately called for violent evasive maneuvers or other countermeasures. In most cases, the gunship escaped. Sometimes, disaster was unavoidable. One night in uh, 1972, we've been fragged into the Ashaw Valley. We just rolled into a firing orbit, and a 37 millimeter fired off about six rounds right off of our five o'clock position. And then mixed in with that anti-aircraft fire, here come a, a, a surface-to-air missile right straight for us. The missile kept locked on to us and coming. We fired a flare, it missed the flare, kept coming right on. And the missile came right up past the tail. 
came right in and exploded right in the number two engine. And the plane violently shook. And all of a sudden, within about 10 seconds, there was a whirl of fire running down the side of the aircraft, past the tail, and probably at least 100 foot, 200 feet back into the air. And it was just a big roaring furnace. I pulled back off of the ramp, and I instinctively reached and unhooked my harness that had me attached to the plane. I turned and I reached back and got my chute. And about that time, the plane was starting to roll over and down. And I said, I got to get out of the airplane. And I got right on the edge of the ramp and started pushing over with uh, all of my might. I had my parachute in my hand, and all of a sudden, a loud explosion took place in the back of the airplane, and it shot me out through the back of the airplane, and all of a sudden, everything kind of went black. I was falling through the sky, and the plane was away from me, and when my chute opened, it was just debris falling everywhere all around me. The plane was still headed towards the ground underneath me, and I seen it hit the ground and just scatter across, basically across the jungle floor. In all, Six AC-130s were downed throughout the war, killing 52 airmen. While the Spectre had evolved into a phenomenal interdiction weapon, there was a problem. By 1967, ground commanders throughout Vietnam were desperate for more gunships. Allied offensives and widespread communist assaults were creating the need for more and better close air support. But new AC-130s were being diverted out of country for missions against the trail. The problem was finally addressed in the spring of 1969 with the arrival of the 71st Special Operations Squadron and Gunship 3, the AC-119 Shadow. Converted from the lumbering old C-119 flying boxcar, the Shadow was designed for the critical close air support role and was the true follow-on to Spooky. By December, the U.S. had transferred all of its Spookies to the Vietnamese and Royal Laotian Air Forces, and the Shadow became the sole U.S. gunship based in Vietnam. Although U.S. involvement in the war had begun to diminish under President Nixon's plan for Vietnamization, fierce fighting continued to rage throughout the country. Outposts, hamlets, bases, and cities were repeatedly assaulted. Allied forces regularly engaged the Viet Cong, and even larger and more heavily armed North Vietnamese battalions in bloody battles. Timely, accurate, and overwhelming close air support remained the most effective defense against communist assaults a mission for which the Shadow was well prepared. Equipped with four miniguns, one more than Spooky, a night observation site, a semi-automatic flare launcher, and a 20-kilowatt illuminator, Shadow crews could pinpoint enemy forces and deliver a lethal barrage of fire, even at night. A fire control system further enhanced weapon accuracy and even included a safety display to prevent crews from firing on friendly positions. A second version of the Shadow, the AC-119 Stinger, was also deployed to Vietnam in late 1969. Armed with four miniguns, two 20-millimeter cannons, a forward-looking infrared sensor, and various advanced radar systems, Stinger crews bolstered Spectre interdiction operations throughout Southeast Asia. However, because the 119s were somewhat underpowered, hard to maneuver and vulnerable to enemy fire, their principal and most effective mission remained the mission that had started it all, defense of friendly forces on the ground. The gunship was a very good assignment because you were doing something that was saving lives. Quite often we would go out, troops in contact. These are, you know, 18, 20 year old army sergeants out in the jungle. The jungle itself was hostile, even if there weren't any Viet Cong around. And when we would arrive, they'd be talking in a whisper that was almost impossible to hear. And after we'd been flying over cover over them for 
20 minutes or a half an hour, they'd be talking in a normal voice. And you could tell that they were going to get some sleep that night that they wouldn't have got if you hadn't been there, even if we didn't have any uh, enemy to fire at. Throughout the Vietnam War, the gunship evolved from a crude defensive weapon into one of the most deadly and sophisticated airborne predators of all time. From repelling enemy assaults on forts and villages to destroying supplies as they moved down the trail, the relatively small and unusual gunship force emerged as a premier defender of Allied forces, and indeed, of South Vietnam as a whole.